Howdy y'all, I'm Matt, Chief of the Flutter Bounty Hunters. Welcome to On the Hunt, a Flutter podcast. As Flutter developers, we create widgets all day, every day. It's our bread and butter. But very few of us stop to ask how we should design those widget APIs. Well, today we're gonna talk about how to build widgets that developers love to use. So let's get into it. We learn unique lessons about how to work with Flutter and Dart. And then we open source that work for the rest of the community. I am a Flutter maximalist. As Flutter developers, we create new widget classes every day. Often we don't think twice about those widget APIs. We throw a few properties in a constructor and move on. It's easy to create widget APIs that make sense in the moment, but don't necessarily play well over time. Let's talk about an easy mindset that you can use to design better widget APIs that work well in the long run. The first question is, are you an app developer or a toolkit developer. When you sit down at your desk to build a new widget, ask yourself if you're an app developer or a toolkit developer. And this, this isn't a question about your job title or your role at your company. I mean, literally right now. For this widget right here, are you operating as an app developer or a toolkit developer? An app developer designs and builds widgets for the purpose of implementing a UI specification. These are the widgets that users see and touch. These are called user-facing widgets. A toolkit developer designs and builds widgets for other developers. These are called toolkit widgets. There can be a little bit of overlap here. That's why this is kind of a top-level, high-level heuristic. So whatever you're working on, which of these categories best represents what you're building? User-facing widgets or toolkit widgets? Now, any app of sufficient size will include both user-facing widgets and toolkit widgets. The first step to design a great widget is to decide, decide which type you're actually building. By definition, user-facing widgets are the end of the line. They're the final piece of code that renders the experience that you ship to users. These widgets only need to honor the details in your UI design specification. Contrary to popular belief, you don't win any points for adding more complexity beyond what's required. Your first goal when designing a user-facing widget is to meet the expectations of your UI specification. A user-facing widget might have a few configurable properties, such as, let's say, a label on a button, or that button's tap callback. If you've accumulated more than a handful of properties in a user-facing widget, you're probably doing it wrong. It's not a guarantee, again, we're working through a heuristic, but in general, more often than not, if you have more than a handful of properties in a user-facing widget, something has gone wrong. Once a user-facing widget meets the configuration needs of the UI spec, the very next priority is speed of development. This means that other developers can quickly read and understand your widget code. So give your widget a meaningful name. Do the same for each widget property. Add appropriate Dart docs for the class and each property. Careful naming and effective documentation might seem like a task for toolkit developers. And of course it is, but it's also a critical task for app developers. Your code is written once, but it may be read thousands of times. Moreover, while it's tempting to declare your code, quote, self-documenting, let's, let's be real, in practice, it's usually impossible to write self-documenting code. We can have that conversation for another day, but today I'm going to leave it at that assertion. It's usually impossible to write self-documenting code. There are the details in your lines of code, and then there are the details between your lines of code. Find the details in between the lines and explain those details in concise Dart doc comments for each class, method, and property. Once your code fulfills your spec, is as simple as possible, and contains useful names and comments, stop. Stop what you're doing. 
Apps need to move fast. You need to ship new features, ship experiments, and fix bugs. Don't add a bunch of properties for the sake of it. Push your changes and move on. The reason that you don't need to worry about the future when you're building user-facing widgets is because you own the app code and no one else depends upon it. You own it, no one else needs it. When the UI specification changes and you need to adjust the behavior of a widget, you don't have to worry about breaking other projects or other teams or other features. It's cheap to alter user-facing widgets, so spend your bandwidth on throughput, not infinite configuration. To summarize, when designing user-facing widgets, first, solve for your UI specification, second, solve for speed of development, third, move on. Now let's talk about toolkit widgets. Widget design gets more interesting when you're designing a toolkit widget. Toolkit code is expensive to change. By definition, other developers depend upon your toolkit widgets. Based on what you're building, it's possible that projects within other companies depend upon your toolkit widgets. The more developers that depend on a widget, and the greater the distance between you and those developers, the more careful you need to be with the design process. Toolkit developers need to minimize code churn so that other developers aren't forced to routinely change their code to stay in compliance with the Toolkit Widgets API. Additionally, Toolkit developers need to support the broadest set of use cases possible so that they don't disenfranchise other developers. The tools at our disposal are called Widget Composition and Property Configuration. Both of these tools give developers control over the final behaviors of a Toolkit widget. The difference between these two tools is the direction that they point in the widget tree. Let's start by discussing widget composition. Widget composition allows developers to express different use cases around a toolkit widget. By altering the widgets that sit higher up in the widget tree, we call those widgets parents or ancestors. Consider a document editor like Super Editor. Super Editor is a package that we've built at the Flutter Bounty Hunters. It's a configurable, extensible document editing toolkit. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, maybe go give it a try. But considering Super Editor, or something like Super Editor, a document editor could be represented by one single widget, which includes all user behavior for the editor. But now imagine that you need to create a document editor that uses the same document layout, but you need different gestures for interacting with the document. You want your editor to do different things based on taps, double taps, triple taps, and drags. Well, what do you do? If the entire document editor is one big widget without any smaller widgets, then changing gesture control actually requires that you build an entirely new document editor and reinvent everything. It's a horrendous situation. And yet, toolkit developers put app developers in situations like that all the time. On the other hand, if the document editor is comprised of one widget for document layout and another widget for gesture handling, then you, the app developer, can reuse the document layout widget and wrap it with your own version of a gesture handler. This reduces the amount of rework by 99.9%. What's the technical difference between these two situations? The difference is that the first solution provided a monolith that came with a quote, all or nothing offer. The second solution still provided a widget for a full document editing experience, but that document editor widget was composed of other public widgets, which effectively solved smaller common document editing problems, namely document layout and document gesture interaction. Developers often try to stuff every possible configuration into widget properties. Widget properties have their purpose, and we'll discuss them next, but not every type of control should be a property on a widget. Attempting to provide a property for every possible configuration is guaranteed to deliver two results. First, your widget constructor will be absurdly large and complicated. Second, you'll still fail to account for all sorts of use cases. So it's a losing proposition. Effective toolkit developers know when to rely on composition up the tree instead of property configuration down the tree. 
your job as a toolkit developer isn't to solve all problems for all developers. Your job is to solve one problem for all developers. Let your users make their own decisions about everything else. Of the two available tools, Widget Composition and Configurable Properties, Widget Composition is far more powerful. And in my opinion, Widget Composition is grossly underutilized by the community. If you're unsure about how to facilitate ancestor-descendant relationships, the easiest way to set up these relationships is by passing global keys. When an ancestor holds a global key that's attached to a descendant, the ancestor can directly talk to the descendant. This, for example, is one way to separate a document editor's gesture handler widget from the document editor's layout widget. Toolkit developers should be completely comfortable with using global keys to split independent widget responsibilities. Now let's move on to configurable properties. I said we have composition and we have properties. Let's talk about properties. Configurable properties allow developers to express different use cases inside of a toolkit widget by altering the widgets that sit lower in the widget tree. We call those widgets children or descendants. Configurable properties can also alter the behavior of a render object that belongs to a widget. Widget properties are unavoidable when designing widgets, so every Flutter developer is surely familiar and comfortable with using them. The important thing to recognize about widget properties is that they should only configure details that can't be configured by widget composition. So consider an image widget. The image widget has a property called fit. The fit property determines how the image is sized based on the available space. The image can be sized to take up all available space even if it cuts off part of the image, or the image can be sized so that you can see the entire image even if it leaves some empty space, or the image can be distorted to fit exactly the width and height of the available space even if it changes the aspect ratio. Those are, kind, those are the primary options that you have for fitting an image. The image widget is solely responsible for painting image pixels to the screen. No other widget can take over that responsibility. The image widget literally exists for this purpose. Therefore, it wouldn't make any sense to try to control an image's fit from an ancestor widget. The way the image pixels are scaled to fit the available space is fundamentally a responsibility of the image widget, and so it's controlled by a property on the image widget. Widget properties can also include child widgets. For example, a padding widget takes a single child, a column, row, and stack each accept an arbitrary list of children. A scaffold accepts an app bar, body, drawer, and floating action button. Each of these properties configures the structure of the widget tree beneath the widget in question. They configure the descendants. As a rule of thumb, when a toolkit widget needs to configure its descendants, or a toolkit widget needs to configure a behavior which can only be implemented by the toolkit widget, then you should use widget properties to achieve that configuration. Everything else should be left to widget composition because doing so leaves as many doors open as possible. Let's talk about predicting the future and why I think you should try to predict the future. When designing user-facing widgets, I told you to, to never try to predict the future because it saves you nothing and it always costs you something. That calculus is reversed when you're working on toolkit widgets. Toolkit widgets deserve and require thorough analysis of likely future requirements. So throw all that Yagni stuff in the trash. It's just going to get you into trouble. As previously mentioned, changes to toolkit widgets are costly. Every API change breaks your users. If you break your users a few too many times, they'll stop using your toolkit widgets. The only way to minimize breaking changes is to predict the future. Now, humans are terrible at predicting the future. The only thing worse is to make no attempt at all. The most powerful tool I've found when it comes to predicting the future is to find and respect what are called the axes of change. To understand the axes of change, you must first understand the difference between essential complexity and accidental complexity. Essential complexity is the complexity that's baked into the problem itself. Nothing you do can ever reduce the essential complexity. It doesn't matter what language or framework you choose. It doesn't matter what design patterns you implement. It doesn't matter what algorithms you invent. Literally, the problem itself has complexity, and that's called essential complexity. 
accidental complexity is everything else. All the overhead added by decisions you make qualify as accidental complexity. Now, the term is a little misleading. Accidental complexity doesn't mean that you accidentally added complexity. Most accidental complexity is on purpose, or at least you know you're doing it. All solutions add some amount of complexity on top of the problem itself, because the tools you're using to solve the problem force some amount of complexity upon you. Therefore, Every toolkit widget that you build will contain the essential complexity of the problem, as well as the accidental complexity of your tools and choices. With that said, let's get back to this concept of the axes of change. Axes of change are places within the fundamental problem where requirements are likely to change independently of one another. The easiest way to understand this is probably to look at an example. Now, looking at an example is much easier to do in the blog post. So if you do get a chance to go look at the blog post, there's some example code in this section. I'll try to give you the overview of what's demonstrated in that code. Let's talk about Interactive Viewer. Interactive Viewer is a Flutter framework widget that makes it easy to build a scene that the user can pan and zoom. So think think about viewing a photograph on your phone. You can pinch to zoom in, pinch to zoom out, and you can use one finger to move up, down, left, right. That's called panning. Interactive Viewer is a framework widget in Flutter that gives you those capabilities. Assume that you're using Interactive Viewer in your app. You want everything that Interactive Viewer does, except you don't want Interactive Viewer to respond to Apple Pencil interaction. You want the Apple Pencil to draw shapes in the viewport. You don't want the Apple Pencil panning the viewport up and down and left and right. And that you may not even realize that that's what Interactive Viewer would do, but if you take an Apple Pencil and you start scribbling on Interactive Viewer, it treats that as if it's your finger. And what does your finger do? Well, your finger pans up, down, left, right. That's what the Apple Pencil does. But we don't want that because the Apple Pencil is supposed to be used for drawing. So what do you do? Well, it turns out that you can't do anything. You have to throw away all of Interactive Viewer and start over because Interactive Viewer combined layout behavior with gesture behavior. Imagine that Flutter got rid of Interactive Viewer and replaced it with various compositional widgets. So again, we have example code here. It's going to be a little difficult to explain this in words, but instead of having one Interactive Viewer widget, I want you to imagine two widgets put together, one parent, one child. The parent is called Infinite Canvas Gestures, and the child is called Infinite Scene Builder. This new version, you could say it's slightly more complicated than the first one, than the interactive viewer itself, but the widgets are now broken down by the natural axes of change. There's one widget that responds to gestures, called Infinite Canvas Gestures, and another widget that handles layout for the scene, called Infinite Scene Builder. With the second widget structure, you would still need to replace infinite canvas gestures with your own version that includes Apple Pencil support. But at least in that case, you could still use the infinite scene builder as is. Also, it's worth noting, the layout behavior is much more complex than the gesture behavior. So it's actually a big win to reuse the infinite scene builder widget. That would still save you the vast majority of the time that it would take to start over from scratch. Fundamentally, Interactive Viewer is solving two independent problems. The first problem is the layout and caching of infinite 2D content. That's the actual content that you're panning around and zooming. Laying that out, making it the correct size, that's one problem. The second problem is the application of user gestures to the XY offset in the zoom level of the content. By respecting these axes of change and solving these problems with independent widgets, These toolkit widgets give greater power and flexibility to app developers. Now, the last thing I'll say on this topic is that some developers who are overly technical, they think that axes of change are something that they invent by way of a clever API design. But that's not correct. The order is backwards. Axes of change existed before you ever investigated the problem, let alone solved the problem. The best you can hope to do as a developer is to discover the API, discover, not invent, 
discover the API which best respects the axes of change. You're not inventing some tech toy from scratch. Instead, you're trying to fit your API around the existing problem as tightly as you can. It's kind of like sucking a piece of plastic around the shape of a mold. The problem itself has moving parts. Your toolkit widgets should strive to have the same moving parts. Let's talk about the most common mistake that developers make. There is a great irony in most widget development. It's the irony of app developers trying to create toolkit widgets and toolkit developers accidentally creating user-facing widgets. And the reason for this mistake, funny enough, is personal insecurity. App developers churn out features. They are the assembly line workers of the software development industry. A bunch of sophisticated parts appear before the app developers, and the app developer's job is to quickly assemble those parts into the final product. The problem is that those app developers spent as much time in college as the toolkit developers who created the sophisticated parts. The app developers feel like they're wasting their talents on the assembly line. Now, to make themselves feel like real software engineers, app developers start adding a bunch of properties to widgets. They start inventing their own requirements for the future so that they feel like they're engineering something. And these additional properties aren't just some bullion flags and strings. No. App developers like to go all in by adding a bunch of streams to their widgets. Everybody knows that you need a computer science degree to figure out how to work with streams. So we should have streams everywhere. This is how app developers think. At the root of this problem is an insecurity about one's place in the development ecosystem. By filling app teams with computer science grads, there is an incentive for those developers to prove their intelligence and knowledge. They do so by grossly overcomplicating the assembly of parts provided by others. What those developers should do is either recognize that they're working on an assembly line and focus on throughput, or find a toolkit team to join. But overcomplicating user-facing widgets isn't helping anyone. Now let's jump to the toolkit side. On the toolkit side, we find a personal insecurity that points the other direction. What's the most embarrassing thing that can happen to a toolkit developer? The most embarrassing outcome is that nobody uses the toolkit widgets that the developer built. A toolkit developer wants to feel wanted and needed. This insecurity leads to a false assertion. Toolkit developers think to themselves that the best way to gain adoption is to build the simplest tool possible. With the simplest possible tool, developers will be willing to try the tool, and they'll love it, and the toolkit will have great success. But actually, this assumption is usually wrong. The job of a toolkit is to solve sophisticated problems by creating tools that can be used by all developers within a particular audience. If you're a toolkit developer on an app team, your audience is all the other app developers on that team. If you're a tool, uh, toolkit developer in the Flutter community, your audience is everyone in the world suffering from the given problem. Not only do the toolkit solutions need to match the variability of that audience, but they also need to be structured in a way that keeps them relatively stable over time. On the one hand, of course toolkit developers should strive for ease of use. But it's critical that toolkit developers understand that ease of use is not the same thing as simplicity. Sometimes problems really are complex. When toolkit developers create simple tools, they massively overconstrain the solution. Only a portion of the audience is able to use the tool, and over time, even that portion of the audience is forced out by their own evolving requirements. As a result, the toolkit developers focus on simplicity for the sake of adoption, becomes the primary reason that the toolkit withers and dies. Toolkit developers should instead focus on the intrinsic complexity of the problem, identify axes of change, and then utilize widget composition and property configuration to provide a holistic solution to the entire problem. This is how a toolkit thrives in the long run. In conclusion, when you begin work on a new widget, Start by asking yourself whether you're building a user-facing widget or a toolkit widget. If you're building a user-facing widget, 
optimize for visual polish and speed of development. If you're building a toolkit widget, optimize for composition and configuration. This simple decision process may not answer every widget design question that you have, but it will consistently promote the most appropriate considerations and trade-offs as you expand your widget portfolio each and every day. Now, if widget API design is something that's challenging your team, I offer services personally for proprietary work. I can help your team analyze widget requirements and design widget APIs. Feel free to reach out to me at superdeclarative.com. Similarly, if you're looking for toolkit widgets and you're not sure how to build out infrastructure that way, the Flutter Bounty Hunters build open source software professionally for Flutter and Dart. By all means, go to flutterbountyhunters.com and send us a message to let us know that you'd like our help. With that, good luck with all your widget API design, and y'all come back now, you hear? Thank you.